today will be as to what happens once a surgical consult has been placed um, uh, for dialysis patients. And we feel, you know, our group feels very passionately about it because I think most of the times we find that uh, that we can communicate better, both at your end and our end, because these patients are certainly very complex patients and they need more uh, of their providers having communication with each other. So I'm uh, very proud to represent uh, the largest uh, vascular surgery group in the central Pennsylvania uh, and the only vascular surgery group with the integrated vascular surgery residency program. I do not have any financial interest. So I guess my first question is to talk about what is a surgeon doing in a nephrology conference and why even, even talk about it. And I think uh, the, the long story short is that you, the audience in this room knows firsthand that dialysis is only a one piece of puzzle for this very complicated cohort of patients. We all know that patients who are in dialysis are at an extremely high risk of dying and at an extremely risk of high risk of significant other comorbidities. Uh, in fact, when we operate on these patients for, for dialysis-related uh, operations and non-dialysis-related operations, uh, anesthesio anesthesiologists always tell us that, that the risk of dying is, is excessive, even for doing something very simple. And I do believe that care of dialysis patients is a team effort. It requires multiple providers, multiple healthcare providers from different specialities to come together to provide care for provide care for these patients. And all as all of us know, we're only as strong as the weakest link in the in the team. Uh, so I'll give you uh, a surgeon's perspective as to what goes on behind the scenes when we when we get uh, when we get into uh, dialysis uh, patients referrals. So I'll go over basic principles, and then I'll talk about a few um, um, things specific to our, our Penn State Health, uh, and to talk about surgeon's role in access creation and access maintenance. Uh, so first of all, believe it or not, uh, as a vascular surgery group, we actually do pay a lot of attention to DOKI guidelines. Uh, every year, we have at least two of our education sessions are dedicated to talk about what is new in the DOKI guidelines about, about uh, patients on dialysis. And as the audience in this room is very well aware that the DOKI guidelines would suggest that when patients reach uh, kidney stage four disease, uh, they need timely education about possibility of going on dialysis. And once they reach uh, stage five or GFR of less than 15, that's when the dialysis is initiated. And for patients who choose hemodialysis, uh, what are their options and what can we do to prevent uh, dialysis catheters? So um, uh, it is recommended, even DOKI guidelines, is to look at uh, it preoperatively to image the, the blood vessels of these patients to determine who are the patients who are suitable for even considering hemodialysis versus not. So uh, when you make a referral to, for a two, uh, to surgeons for, for dialysis, what we normally at the back end uh, we do is even before we see the patients, we order a cohort of, of different testing, uh, which can be summarized as obtaining arterial duplexes first. And what we're looking in the arms is basically uh, looking at the patency of the arm blood vessels, including subclavian arteries, axillary artery, brachial and radial uh, and ulnar arteries. And the implications are simple that we know now that many patients in the past would have dialysis issues because they had underlying arterial inflow problems which were not, not known at that time or were not addressed uh, before. So for example, if somebody has significant stenosis of the inflow arteries, uh, the fistulas, no matter how good of a job is done in fistula creation, the fistula will likely not work. Uh, and at this day and age, with the advent of minimally invasive procedures, we actually can treat these arteries before we consider fistula placement. Similarly, it gives us very valuable information that if the arch is complete in the palm or not. For example, about 15 to 20% of the normal uh, population will have incomplete palm or arch, and we, we will never know it unless somebody does a, an ultrasound and that would be a contraindication to use radial or ulnar artery inflow because that can cause significant uh, hand ischemia. And then there are, uh, there are cases, about 10% of our vascular lab cases will find high bifurcation of brachial artery way up in the arm. And that, as you can imagine, has its own implications um, uh, when it comes to technique of operation. 
We normally, um, so looking at Kidoki guidelines, I was looking at last night, they recommend two and a half millimeter, at least vein diameter. And uh, normally we, we do about three millimeter vein diameter. Uh, and it's simply because any diameter less than that is highly unlikely for a vein to get mature enough to be able to accommodate dialysis. And that's the reason when people get EV grafts in their arms is because their veins are very, are very, very small. So even so, technically, it's challenging to hook up a 2.5 millimeter vein. But even if even if technically is done correctly, they will not mature. Uh, and also, we look at central vein stenosis. And many times, and as you know, this audience knows, many times when patients get fistulas, and the next thing you know, their normal looking arms becomes extremely swollen, and it's because of the underlying central venous stenosis. Unfortunately, it's very, very, very common for anybody who is, uh, has ever received any central venous catheter, especially central venous uh, dialysis catheters, because it can lead to subclavian stenosis. And in fact, that's something which has led DOKI to guidelines to recommend using IJ as the preferred catheter many years ago, because of the fact that if subclavian vein gets stenosis, um, and develops stenosis, there is a problem for ongoing uh, dialysis down the road. And many times we actually find asymptomatic DVTs. Uh, in these patients as well because of the previous catheters. And of course, that becomes a contraindication to do uh, any fistula work. And I think that's something over the course of past two decades which has changed in the field of surgery is to predict beforehand as to what are the patients who are considered non-suitable for fistula creation. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, um, <laughs> one of our fellows brought this note, a referral note, which said fistula not a graft. And I, you know, I, I uh, you know, we, we respect that uh, when we look at that, <laughs> because it's not that any surgeon would like to do an AV graft. And I'll tell you why. Because technically, it means two anastomoses. When we're doing an AV graft, it's, it's double the work. So why spend more time in the operating room on a sicker patient? So it's not that any surgeon would like to do an AV graft. It's actually easier to do a fistula, a vein fistula. Um, because technically, it's easier. Veins bleed less. They, the anastomosis looks nice. And it's good for patients as well. So all makes sense to do fistula. But these, these are the reasons why we push towards an AV graft if somebody has smaller veins or has a DVT or has central venous occlusion. Uh, so these are the patients who, who get the graft. So the next what happens is that even before we see the patients, when only most vascular surgery practices across the country, it's actually on our Society for Vascular Surgery guidelines, that at the time of the meeting uh, with the patients, we, we should be in a position to offer the patient exactly what operation would they need. Uh, many times patients would not know, for example, if they need two stages for basilic vein fistulas, for example. Uh, we try our best and our guidelines as well as to, to, to see these patients within three, three to four weeks maximum. Um, at Penn State Hershey, uh, we have about seven clinic different locations to accommodate our patients which come from a wide variety of, uh, of uh, geographical areas. And, and then we have, uh, you know, uh, we changed our practice uh, about 10 years ago that we mandated that all fistula patients have to meet a surgeon. I'll explain in a second why. Uh, because we found out that, that unfortunately, uh, there's just so much going on with dialysis patients. And I think taking every, any human being and putting them in a dialysis for four or five hours every other day becomes a significant portion of their lifetimes. And, uh, you know, many times patients are just so confused that they don't understand what goes on, you know, what goes on in their bodies. And what can we do? And what would the life look like once the fish law is created? So we deserve actually 45 minutes for the first meeting with the patients just so they make sure that we go over all the pros and cons and they know exactly what they're getting into. Uh, and as all of, all of you can understand, the level of conversation varies between patients, you know, from patients' age, their understanding, their level of education, uh, we, I recently did fistula on a surgeon, and you know that level of uh, conversation was extremely, um, extremely uh, different and very difficult. Uh, but then patients who are, who just don't know as to what will happen inside the operating room, they just they go to the OR, some magic happens, and they come out, and everything is all fixed forever. Um, so uh, surgical consent by by rules of surgery, we have to include risks, benefits, and alternatives of the of the operation because it is. And as in surgery, we we say that there's nothing known as minor operation; they're only minor surgeons. 
So no operation uh, is, is taken lightly, especially on high-risk patients uh, as it is in dialysis. So this is a consent form for, for fistula, which is make, made by our legal department because of significant problems which happens in the lawsuit. So for example, if you look at a simple fistula procedure, which is standardized, for anybody walking in our clinic getting, and includes multiple, if you look at the risks, include bleeding, clotting, arm ischemia, and death. Uh, we all have experience in patients, you know, under dialysis patients undergoing something as simple as a dialysis catheter, fistulogram, and coding, and dying. So we know that it, it can happen, and it's actually, risk of that happening in dialysis patients is actually higher because of the underlying metabolic derangements that the patients are suffering from. So our consent form actually says that in something as simple as a fistula or a fistulogram. And also I think, you know, uh, for those of you who are following the local newspapers, you, 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 you know it very well that for surgeons, outcomes matter. If the outcomes are not, uh, are not optimal, people lose their jobs, programs, uh, institutions lose programs. So for surgical programs, for example, in our, in our institution, we are held accountable by multiple, multiple benchmarks. So for example, American College of Surgeons for every operation undergoing any university hospital, like including ours, everything is, is, is documented, including complication rates, mortality rates, and whatnot. And then we have vascular surgery uh, quality initiative, which actually goes up to one year. So if a surgeon has a complication such as mortality or operative complication, up to one year after surgery, it shows up on your permanent record. So it is a big deal for us to, to, to pay attention to these outcomes, and frankly, our reputation matters. This is exactly what we feel like if anything goes wrong in the operation, contrary to the popular belief. Uh, you know, uh, when I talked to my mom, I was talking to my mom recently, she, and she felt that, you know, surgeons just go in and make the magic and everything bows down to them and things are great. Maybe there was a day like this, but certainly this day and age, if anything goes wrong, uh, anything. Uh, to give you an example, one of our patients recently had, uh, had some small angiogram done by one of my partners, and a week later, the patient dies in a fire uh, at, at her home. Uh, that counts as surgical mortality because any death, even because of an accident which happens within 30 days after surgery, counts towards surgeon's uh, mortality. So it, it, is as, it is as critical. So when, when a surgeon says no to an operation or is thinking again, is because of multiple things going on behind the back. So our Society for Vascular Surgery actually has made brochures for, for every disease that we treat, especially focusing on dialysis patients. If you have a few pictures, they're actually free public information available on a National Society web, uh, website so that to make it very fair and easier for people to understand. Uh, it basically describes briefly what a fistula is, what are the risks, uh, and how do you, uh, how do you, how to prepare before surgery and what happens after that. So common scenarios we encounter in our, in, our, um, in our real life is that many times patients will show up and thinking that they're gonna come up for 45 minutes appointment and guess what, they're gonna get a fistula by the time they walk out 45 minutes. And uh, it, it is heartbreaking to disappoint uh, them in the first appointment. So for example, you know, this patient would say that, you know, I'm getting a fistula uh, or a report today and uh, for the physicians, we're, we're worried about our, our, um, our patient feedback at the end because at, you know, at Penn State and every place else as well, uh, you know, after every clinic visits, we're getting, we're getting scored and every month we're getting patient scores. So when they ask us this question, the first thing that strikes my mind is that he's gonna walk out and write a bad survey, a <laughs> fistula. <laughs> And then um, uh, we go between the extremes. When patients would come in and they, you know, after surgery, if they have a complication, it's their arm ischemia or bleeding. And sometimes, you know, uh, you, really, you really feel bad that, you know, despite all this, we did not do the good job in explaining the risk of the operation. And there are times when we do such a good job that patients say, okay, we don't want any surgery. And then we get, you know, we're gonna note that the surgeon scared the patient away. So we have to we have to walk a very fine balance between these two extremes, uh, and then you know I think most patients would feel that you know once you get a fistula or a graft in the arm, it's all sort of you know one stop shop and they're done forever. And how many times in our clinics we're repeating these lines that you know there is no tube in the universe which can be poked you know twice uh, every single time with three times a week, and we can expect this tube to go on forever. And that is the reason why nationwide the, the fistula and the graft patency rates are very low. For example, for lower extremity bypasses, we use same veins, same 
uh, PTFE graphs, their pinnacy rates are about 90 to 95% at one year. For fistulas or graft, they're, for fistulas, they're about 40% for vein and about 20% for a graft. And it's simply because for peripheral bypasses, nobody's poking the needle <laughs> twice or three times a week. And I think that's just against the laws of physics. And then there are situations, you know, recently, uh, you know, a patient's family, very well-educated family, and the patient is 92 years old. And then they look in your eyes and they say, what would you do if he was your mom? Uh, so, you know, subjecting a 93 years old, a 95 years old to an operation, um, you know, sometimes getting a haircut is not risk-free <laughs> in these individuals. So these are the situations in which we have to go through. One of our patients recently told us, uh, you're like, you know, why are you here? And say, you want to do fish love because both the kidney doctors, you can make money out of me. <laughs> and and, it's, it's, and I'll see you an example uh, of what Medicare thinks of, of us as physicians. So preoperatively, uh, I think, you know, it's important. We, what we do is that we... For especially for fistula patients, for dialysis patients, we put them through a scrutiny, very tough scrutiny, preoperatively to make sure they are in fit shape to at least tolerate a simple operation. Uh, most of the times we go by meds and without, un, without going into too much details, as you can see that as people get sicker, as humans get sicker, their meds score goes down. And it has been scientifically shown that people will reduce meds score, which is a, which is a very good predictor of our, of our daily function, actually correlates with both cardiovascular mortality and non-cardiovascular mortality. And any human being who is who's dialyzed three times a week, unfortunately, is not the fit, fittest person. And they're generally for dialysis patients, their MET scores are extremely low. That is the reason which, which I think puts them at extremely high risk of surgical complications. Also, this is a free public information and, and American College of Surgeons actually has a very good risk calculator on their website that you can put different, different factors, age and risk factors, you can actually very accurately predict the risk of complications before surgery. To give you an example, in this case, you know, you can see that, you know, if you put different morbidities here, you know, 85 years old female, the history of hypertension, diabetes, which is a lot of our patients, if you put them in the risk calculator, you can predict that about 30% risk of serious complications, 13% risk of death, which is pretty significant for a simple fistula surgery. Uh, and many times we get consulted in the hospital because, you know, somebody is uh, recently, for example, somebody who is not a compliant patient and he's in hospital anyways because of acute kidney injury, acute renal failure, why can't we just do dialysis while they're admitted there? As it turns out that if somebody is suffering from acute renal failure, they're suspected, you know, the serious risk of complications actually goes higher after simple sedation uh, procedure to about, up to about 31%. And if somebody is in congestive heart failure and acute renal failure at the same time, in hospital stay, if we were to perform a simple fistula surgery, their risk of mortality is actually 20%, which is very, very high for an elective surgery. We normally, anything considered more than 2% is considered super high risk. So these are the reasons when we're not jumping on uh, doing acute dialysis uh, procedures on, on patients who are, in or who are inpatient. Um, so normally, uh, all patients do undergo anesthesia appointment. It reduces anxiety. It sort of like brings familiarity with the anesthesia team. Uh, we normally, uh, you know, tend to give them the date of operation during the initial visit. And we actually, at the time of the, when we book operation, we actually give them not only the date of surgery, but we also give them the date of follow-up in four to six weeks. Um, this, and the and our anesthesiologist, you know, we have a, uh, we have a special request for dialysis patients to do a very thorough preoperative evaluation. And you, you can see that they assign the MET scores, they look at the medication list, a lot of scrutiny which you go through to make sure, um, you know, we evaluate them. For dialysis patients in general, you know, the ASA score, American Society of Anesthesiology score, their scores are usually class four. To give you a broader perspective, if anybody goes to hospital for appendicitis, their ASA score is usually one or two. Uh, for dialysis patients, it's usually four. Uh, which tells you that they are extremely high risk for developing complications because of metabolic derangements. Uh, scientifically, as the ASA scores high, the risk of uh, mortality and medical complications goes significantly high. Um, you know, postoperatively, we, we monitor patients. This is usually a same-day procedure, but for first four hours, we monitor them for, for different complications, including bleeding, arm ischemia, nerve damage, pain. Uh, and when patients get, you know, there's a few discharge records from the, from the hospital itself, 
Uh, they usually get very detailed information as to what they can do, what they cannot do. For example, driving, when can they start eating and drinking, when can they start using the arms. Uh, normally we advise them not to drive after getting a fish in the arm for first week or so, especially if they're getting any, any pain medications. Um, and then every patient who gets a fistula usually gets a post-op day. Uh, one phone call we have demonstrated, we actually published papers on this topic, that getting a nursing phone call on post-operative day one on patients who get the same day operation actually reduces the number of ER visits and number of readmissions. So we asked them a host of questions, as you can see, um, uh, about, about their pain, about their, about lots of different things. And that helps us determine who is doing well and who is not doing well and to prevent complications and readmissions. Uh, normally we see them four to six weeks later and then we assess the fistula and determine the need if it can be used or can or does it need further procedures. Um, now uh, another thing I want to talk really quickly is that I think in the field of medicine in the past 10 years which has changed a lot is the maintenance, uh, the concept of maintenance. It does not limit it to fistula patients, it's also applicable to cardiology patients, to heart failure patients. That uh, usually, you know, in the field of interventions, it, there's a focus away from doing too many interventions because every intervention comes with its own risks. So for example, you know, even DOKI guidelines would suggest that patients on dialysis, physical examination is the key to determine um, if somebody needs a fistula gram or not. Uh, these are the DOKI guidelines, which actually say that, you know, uh, listening to thrill list and hearing brewery are the two most important clinical factors, which should be done for every single patient at dialysis. Now, uh, you know, for when I was under training, you know, about 10, 15 years ago, there was a practice of doing routine fistulograms every three months or so. And if you roll back the time 15 years ago, it was also a normal practice for cardiologists to do routine cardiac cats for anybody who had, who had cabbage done. But because of the fact that you know public perception, which I'll talk in one second, that physicians are doing more procedures than necessary, uh, there's financial incentive, of course, that the federal government and the lawyers have gone after for procedure for people who are doing unnecessary procedures. So this is just from last month. You can see that the U.S. government actually filed a lawsuit against one of the very prominent dialysis companies, saying that the routine fistulograms should be should be prohibited. I know a few interventional radiologists and vascular surgeons in New York City and California who have been sued and have lost the lawsuits for the practice of doing every three to five months fistulogram. And in fact, if you even order a fistula duplex without, for, for maintenance reasons, CMS would actually not allow it unless we put the buzzwords as bleeding or, or arm swelling or reduced thr thrill or reduced brewery. So this is something which is very important, especially for surgeon standpoint to do to, for, in terms of maintenance of fistula, fistula work. Also daunting is, and this was New York Times uh, uh, second page news about seven years ago. And in which and this is what public thinks of us as, as, as physicians and care providers. That they, they said that the Medicare actually prevented the cardiac cat, the practice of routine cardiac cats doing every six months or every year. And they noticed that with the decrease in number of cardiac cats, it paralleled the number of increased number of peripheral angiograms for legs, and that also included fistulograms. So this is what public thinks of us, that uh, when, <laughs> when physicians are not performing cardiac cats, they're performing other procedures. So clearly because of the financial incentive. So we, we have to be very, very cognizant of the environment that in, in which we are practicing. So if, a bottom line is fistulogram is not the solution for every patient. There are many, many other problems going on with these fistula patients. And then of course there are, uh, in terms of maintenance of dialysis access, you know, there are urgencies and there are emergencies. So if anybody has thrombosed, you know, fistula or graft or active bl pulsatile bleeding or acute arm ischemia, they need immediate surgical evaluation and treatment. And these are the people who benefit from referral to emergency room right away because of uh, life-threatening or limb-threatening issues for these patients. And then there are elective situations, which is bulk of the common situations in which patients have either prolonged bleeding time after dialysis or suffering from low volumes during dialysis or high or high venous pressures, and it's recommended by DOKI guidelines and our Society for Vascular Surgery guidelines to do something within two weeks to address the underlying problem, which is either arterial or venous most of the times. Uh, to summarize, uh, you know, I think uh, I think from a surgeon's perspective, end-stage renal disease patients are extremely high-risk surgical patients. 
And uh, any surgical operation uh, is, it requires a very thoughtful evaluation and a face-to-face -face conversation uh, with a very frank discussion about risk and benefit ratios. Uh, and surgical important outcomes are important for surgeons. They're also very, very important for our patients. We've all seen patients dying during simple procedures. So I think it is very important to, to look at their outcomes as well. And it has serious implications for all of us. I thank you so much for your attention.